Beginning in the primary of 2020, Washington County will be using pull pads for roster check-in. These pull pads will take the place of paper rosters and paper EDR forms in the precinct. The pull pad will only include the voters registered in the precinct where you are working. Voters will form one line and will go to the next available pull pad judge as voters are processed. Each precinct will have a minimum of two pull pads and might have a maximum of six pull pads. This number will depend on the number of registered voters in your precinct. You'll note that for the primary this year, we expect turnout to be about 10%. You will not need to use all of the poll pads in order to process your voters successfully. We're giving you all of them though in this election so that you have the opportunity to set up your polling locations as if it were a general election and can rework the configuration of the room if necessary. Another feature of the poll pads is that both registered and election day registrants can check in on any of the poll pads. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. The first thing on election morning is going to be to set up your MiFi unit. This MiFi unit will provide connectivity to the iPads. This device will be located either in your clear tote or in the blue box with other supplies. To set it up, you'll plug in the power cord to the front of the unit. If there are red antenna covers on your unit, you'll pull those off and screw in one antenna on each side. You'll then plug in the power cord to a power source. Make sure that it is a working outlet. The lights will blink from yellow to green. And once you see green lights, you'll know that you have connectivity. When the pull pads are set up, they should be set up after this is done. Check to make sure that they are connected. You'll know they're connected because you will see the Wi-Fi symbol in the upper right hand corner of the iPad. Next, let's go through the pull pad and the components inside the green cases. You could set up all the components except for the iPads before election day. The head judge, co-head judge, or city clerk will keep the iPads with them as the iPads contain roster data for your precinct. When you begin to set up the pull pad, you could pull out all of the components inside the case. The pull pad stand as well as the printer cords are underneath the pull pad base. You could pull out those first. Next, take out the printer. And finally, remove the rest of the items. We'll set the printer up first. The first thing you'll do is open the green case and remove the printer, adapter, and power cords. You'll connect the power adapter to the power cord. Ensure that this connection is secure. Now you're going to connect the plug to the back of the printer. This plug is round and also has a flat side with an arrow. That flat side should be facing up. I like to put the printer on its nose so that the back of the printer is facing up. Then it's easy to see where that plug goes in on the right side. As I said before, you'll put the flat side up with the arrow going into the printer. You'll hear a little click, and that's how you'll know that the cord is secure. You can also lightly jiggle the cord to ensure that you have a secure connection. Then you'll plug the printer into the outlet. You'll make sure that your check-in table is close to a wall, or you could also use an extension cord to plug all of your items in for the pull pads. Once your printer is plugged in, you can use the on off switch located on the left side of the printer. You'll know that your printer is on when you see a green power light on the front panel of the printer. Once the pull pad is powered on, the devices will wirelessly pair and you could look for a blue light on the back of the printer 
once the pull pad is on to confirm that that connection is successful. Next, we'll talk through setting up the pull pad. The pull pad is an iPad. The most important buttons to know is that in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the power button or number one on the screen. The other button that you may need throughout the day is the home button. That's located near the right center of the screen. To put the pull pad together, you'll first take out the stand arm and fold it flat. Next, you'll put the iPad face down on a table. Then you'll press the buttons on the side of the arm and place it in the circular opening. You should release the buttons and you can rotate the arm until it clicks. Connect the arm to the base. I like to put my thumbs through the arm, the hole in the middle there, and push it into the base. Once it's attached, you can rotate the pull pad to make sure that the camera is on top, the upper left, and that it's oriented in a landscape position. You'll attach the photo ID tray now. The ID tray just slides on the back of the iPad case. Don't force it too far. You'll note that the arrows should be lined up with the camera on the back of the iPad. Once the ID tray is on, you can insert the stylus into the holding slot. Then you can adjust the pull pad to, so it is a suitable angle for you to read. Next, we can connect to a power source. Just like our cell phones, for many of us, you'll plug the USB cable that's green into the power adapter. This is a small dark purple plug. You'll open the plug and connect it to a power source. It's okay to use either an extension cord or a power strip for these. Then you'll connect the cable to the pull pad lightning connector. That's the hole on the right side of the iPad. The pull pads will automatically be powered on when they're connected to a power source. The pull pad should automatically turn on. If it doesn't, confirm that it's plugged in. If it still isn't powered on, push the power button in the top left side of the screen. This home screen will pop up when your iPad has powered on. The pull pads will only work in the pull pad app throughout the election day. Once everything is powered on, we want you to run through this morning checklist. Ensure that the name of the jurisdiction is Washington County. That'll let you know that your pull pad is configured correctly. Next, check that the election name and date are correct. It should say something like 2020 statewide primary, and the date should be 8-11-2020. If you're working in the general it, or another election, it will reflect that information on the iPad. Please then make sure that the polling place location is correct. That will read where it currently says on the screen, Mall of America. Next, make sure that your check-in count in the upper middle of your screen says zero. This means that no voters have been processed yet that morning. Next, check that your battery life is close to full. And finally, confirm that your Wi-Fi connection has been made. Now we're gonna test our printer. In the upper right-hand corner of the pull pad screen, there is a green printer icon. The green printer icon means that you're connected to the printer. Next, Press the green printer icon button and select test, print test receipt. A sample receipt will print and then you'll know that your printer is ready to go. All right, it's 7 a.m. and the polls are open. Press get started to process your first voter. Our first voter of the day has arrived. Just as before, you'll ask the voter for his first and last name. Our first voter is George Washington. You'll also note that he tells us he lives at 2659 West Gulf Drive South. Now let's search for him. We're going to search for him using the rule of three. We'll always search using the last three, 
excuse me, the first three letters of a voter's last name and the first three letters of their first name. Because only the voters in this, your specific precinct are on the iPad, using the first three of the first and last name will allow you to narrow down the list enough to find the voter. On your pull pad, you'll touch Get Started. Then we'll search for George, W-A-S for Washington and G-E-O for George. Then touch Search. We see George Washington here. We could ask him to confirm his residential address next. He confirms for us that he lives on West Gulf Drive at 2659. Now we're at the voter confirmation screen. We should turn the iPad around for the voter to review the information on the screen. The voter doesn't need to touch the screen at all, just visually confirm that the information is up to date and correct for them. Then turn the iPad back to you as the election judge and touch accept. Now we're at the poll worker confirmation screen. This is where you as the election judge should confirm that you found the correct voter and that the voter has confirmed their information as well. Once you've confirmed that, you should initial in the right corner in the initial box and touch submit. Once you touch submit, their voter's check-in certificate, which the voter needs to sign, will print. Their voter receipt will also print. We'll show photos of that in a few slides. As I mentioned, you'll turn the iPad a half turn for the voter to confirm their personal data after you select them from their list. Then you'll turn the iPad back to you as the election judge, and you will touch accept with the stylus in the upper right-hand corner. The election judge will then use the stylus to initial on the screen on the right side, and touch submit. The election judge is the only one that should be touching the iPad with the stylus throughout all of the voter transactions. Once you hit submit, your check-in certificate will print. The voter is going to sign the check-in certificate and return it to the election judge. You'll then put the check-in certificate upside down in the short white bin and then you'll hand the voter their voter receipt. These used to be a colored receipt piece of paper. Then you'll direct them to the ballot and demonstration table. Like I mentioned, you'll have two white bins, one bin for check-ins and one bin for EDR and voucher forms. The long bin will be for EDR forms and the short bin will be for check-in forms. All of the forms should be placed face down for voter privacy. Now let's check in our next voter. This voter tells us his name is John Smith. You'll also note that his birthday is in 1940 and he lives at 2999 Twin Ponds Drive. You'll remember that the voter told his name was us his name was John Smith. So we'll search for SMI in the last name and JOH in the first. We have two John Smiths, so we should ask John what year he was born. John tells us he was born in 1940, so we select that record. Then we'll spin it around for, to ask John to confirm that his information is correct. We'll then initial once we've confirmed the information with the voter and touch submit. John Smith's check-in certificate will now print. He should sign that check-in certificate and then be given his voter receipt. Then he will be, should be directed to the ballot and demonstration table. His signed check-in certificate should go upside down in the check-in certificate white bin. Okay, so our next voter has come into the polling location. He tells us his name is Scott Leindecker. We're going to search for him using the first three letters of his last name, L-I-N, and the first three letters of his first name, S-C-O. All right, let's type in L-I-N to the last name and S-C-O in the first name. 
We search and we don't find any records for him. We'll touch OK. We can use the Advanced Options button now. We do want to clear the information from the last and first name. Let's touch DOB to search for the date of birth. Scott tells us he was born in 1976, so then we'll touch search. Here you can see a Scott Leindecker who spells his last name differently. We should ask Scott how he spells his last name and then ask him to confirm his residential address. We'll then turn the iPad around for him to confirm, turn it back to us, touch next, and then submit after we initial. We'll then check in Scott. Scott is an example of how we might hear a name spelled one way, but really the voter spells it another. Using the advanced options field went a little bit quickly in that last example, so let's talk through it again. The advanced options button is located on the right side of the screen next to the search. Once you touch it, the date of birth, address, and license number banner will pop down. If you touch DOB, a spot will pop up to search for a voter's date of birth. A voter's full date of birth is private information, so we don't want to ask for that in the polling location. However, their year of birth is public data, and so that would be an acceptable thing to ask a voter to help narrow down our search. Address is another field that you can search for a voter by. We'll use that example in just a, in just a few slides. You can also search for a, voter, a voter by their driver's license number. You'll want to again use the rule of three and search for a voter three times before registering them. We want to check various ways that a voter's name could be spelled or misspelled as well as other ways to find the voter before determining that they need to register. Now we're going to talk through a new registrant or an election day registration. As we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, any poll pad can complete an election day registration. So any election judge could complete an election day registration. You're always going to search for the voter, even if they insist that they aren't registered. So let's walk through this Alexander Hamilton example. We'll search for Alexander using his first and last name, the first three letters. We're not able to find him. At this stage, we could ask him to confirm the spelling of his name. However, in this case, we feel confident that we've spelled it correctly. So let's search using another piece of information. We'll touch advanced options and then ask Alex for his year of birth. He tells us it's 1976. We'll touch search and can see that there's a wide list of voters. As we scroll though, we're not able to find Alexander Hamilton. So we can use the reset button under advanced options. Next, you can ask for his address. Touch address, he tells us he's at 842 Limpet Drive. You can see here that when just when we type in 842, the poll pad loads any addresses within the precinct that have that specific house number. Essentially, the precinct finder for your precinct has been loaded onto the poll pad, and as you search, you'll only be able to find addresses within your precinct. Because he lives at Limpet Drive, we'll touch Limpet Drive and then search. We find Robin Wright Jones, who lives on Limpet Drive, but not Alexander Hamilton. So we'll use the register button on the top of the screen to register Alexander. At this stage, we should ask Alexander for his proof of residence. He tells us he has his current driver's license with him that has his updated address and current name on it. We'll ask him these first two questions. He'll confirm for us that he is a US citizen and that he is 18 years on election day. Then we'll touch next. The back of Alexander's driver's license includes a barcode. 
you'll put the, his driver's license into the ID tray and have the barcode facing you. This will allow the camera on the back of the iPad to capture the barcode information. It'll then populate the name and date of birth. You'll then just have to ask the voter for their phone number and enter that in. Once you've entered it, you'll push next. It doesn't automatically enter the address, so you'll have to take the ID and enter it from there. As you type in the street name, just type in a few letters. You'll see that a number of options pop up. Select the one as it is written on the driver's license. We want you to let the pull pad do the data entry for you here. Select the correct address, and then you'll see that it populates the city, state, and zip in. Now touch next. It's going to ask you if you need to fill in a unit number. If you do, you can touch enter unit information. If you do not, you can touch understood. Now it's asking us what the registration identification was. We were provided with Alexander's Minnesota driver's license, so we'll touch that option. You can see that because we scanned his driver's license, it auto populates his driver's license number. So we'll touch next. Now it asks us for the residency verification. Alexander provided us with an ID with current name and address, so we'll select that option. Now we'll touch the type of ID line and select Minnesota driver's license. Again, it auto populates the ID number because we scanned it. The previous voter information screen is optional. We will want you to complete this if a voter is changing their last name. At this stage on this screen, you should ask the voter what their previous last name is and enter it here. The other time we'd like you to complete this screen is if a voter has moved from another state. Ask them for their previous address, both their street address and city and state information. We provide this information to other states to clean up their voter records. We'll touch next because that doesn't apply to Alexander. We'll now spin the screen around, turn the iPad around, and ask Alexander to confirm the information on the screen. This is a double check on our data entry as we process his election day registration information. Once the voter has confirmed, the election judge can touch next. Then it leads us to a screen where we can confirm that we've done the data entry correctly. When we know we have, we can initial and touch submit. Then we'll hit accept and the election day registration certificate will print. Once it's done printing, we can turn the screen once more to the voter and ask them to confirm the information on the screen. This is now the part like signing the roster page. So Alexander will tell us he confirms this information that it looks correct and will touch accept. Then we can initial as the election judge and touch submit. Now his check-in certificate will print. Alexander's election day registration form or certificate is going to print out first. He'll need to sign the bottom of this form just as he would have signed the EDR form in previous years. Next, as we showed on the screen, he'll confirm the information one more time that it is accurate and then his check-in certificate will print. He'll need to also sign the check-in certificate. This is like him signing the EDR roster line in previous years. The EDR form will go into face down in your long skinny basket. The check-in certificate will go into the short basket with all your other check-in certificates. Our next voter that comes in is Zachary Taylor. We'll search for Zach using T-A-Y for Taylor and Z-A-C for Zachary. 
we're able to find Zach as he was previously registered in this precinct on Sandcastle Road. We touch his record and spin the iPad around for Zach to confirm his information for us. At this time, Zach tells us that he was mistaken and did move just a few months ago to a different address within the precinct on Periwinkle, so he no longer lives at Sandcastle Road. Because Zach has moved, he'll need to update his registration today. First, you'll want to use the precinct finder, either on the pull pad or the paper version that's in the head judge folder to confirm that the address on Periwinkle is within your current precinct. Once you've confirmed that his new address is within the precinct, you should let him, you should ask him what sort of documentation he has for proof of residency. In this example, Zach has a U.S. passport and a rent statement. He will be using a photo ID and a document. The green sheet of paper that includes all the valid forms of proof of residency will still be included in your pull pad judge folder. At this stage, Zach tells us that he is needs to re-register because he moved. So we'll touch the registration button at the bottom of the screen. We'll confirm with Zach that he is a US citizen and confirm that he's 18 years old. Zach presents us with a US passport as his photo ID and a rent statement. We'll ask him for his phone number on this screen because that's all that we need to add. Then touch next. Now, to clear the address, you can touch anywhere on the screen or use the clear form button. He tells us he lives at 200 Periwinkle. You'll see that you can just start typing the name of the street, Periwinkle, and it pops up all of the potential Periwinkle ways within the precinct. The same thing will happen in your precinct. Only the addresses will load that are within the precinct. That's why you'll just wanna type three or a couple letters at a time. We'll select the correct address based on what's listed on his rent statement. We also notice that he does have a unit type. He lives in an apartment. You can scroll and see the different types of units. We're going to use apartment, APT, and then type in the unit number, which it says on the rent statement is 235. Then we can touch next. The identification type that he uses is not a driver's license or social security number, so we'll select that option. The residency type he is using is a photo ID and document with current name and address. The type of ID he gives us is a US passport, so we'll select that. Then we'll look at the passport in the upper right hand corner and type in hit the number. Once you get the number in, you'll use the hide keyboard button in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Now, select document type. You can scroll through the list to find the one that your voter has used. Zachary has given us a rent statement, so we'll pick that option. Then we'll touch next. Now we'll turn the screen and ask Zachary to confirm that the information on the screen is up to date and correct. Once he does this, we'll turn the screen back to us and touch next. Now we'll confirm this ourselves and can check the ID numbers. We'll touch next after we sign, then the EDR will print. As Zach's EDR is done printing, we'll then spin the screen one more time and ask him to confirm the information. Then we'll touch accept, then we'll initial and print his check-in certificate by pushing submit. Now you can see that Zachary has been processed. So far, we've processed five total voters, so our check-in number is five. 
We've also registered two of those voters, so our EDR number is two. You can see that in the middle of the screen at the top. Just as with our other election day registration example, Zachary Taylor's Minnesota voter registration application is going to print out first. He'll need to sign that first. Then you can flip that over and put it into your EDR basket. Next, Zach's check-in certificate will print. Zach will also need to sign this. You'll flip it over and put it into your check-in basket. Then you'll hand Zach his voter receipt and direct him to the ballot and demonstration table. Now that we've gone through probably 90% of your transactions, the usual transactions that you're gonna see on election day, let's talk through a few other scenarios you're likely to encounter. John Adams comes into our polling location. He indicates that he might have voted by absentee, but isn't sure if his vote has been counted yet. Let's look him up. We'll use ADA for Adams and JOH for John. As you can see on the screen, there's a red line through his name and AB notation. That stands for absentee voter. As it states on the screen, John has already voted by absentee. Throughout the day, because of the connectivity with the MiFi unit, the county is able to provide updates to as absentee ballots come in through the mail and are accepted at our office. If a voter has any question about whether or not their absentee has been accepted, you can always offer that they can call Washington County directly. Our phone number is listed in a number of places. Your head judge will know it for sure. If you've worked the roster table before, you have seen the CID notation on the roster. These notations will still show up on the poll pad if a voter needs to show their ID in order for their identification to be verified. Miller Fillmore comes into our polling location, and when we look him up, we see that we do need to check his ID. The next screen will show what this process will look like. We'll look up Millard Fillmore with FIL and MIL. As we search, we find him and he confirms that he does live on Limpet Drive. Now the voter can read anything on the screen themselves, or you could read it out loud to them. As the election judge, you should ask the voter to see your identification, may I see your identification? The voter should provide their driver's license or Minnesota ID card. If the ID matches the voter information, the challenge should be cleared, and you should touch the ID confirmed button. If any of the information is different, the voter must re-register. So once again, you'll have Millard confirm his information and touch submit. Then you'll initial and push submit again. His check-in certificate will print. If he's not able to clear this, you'll push no ID. Millard might need to come back later in the day when he has his ID with him, and that's just fine. Challenge notations will also show up on the poll pad. Abraham Lincoln is an example of a challenge. We can either clear the challenge, the voter might refuse the challenge, or a voter might fail the challenge. Here you can see on the next screen what a challenge notation will look like and how the screens will appear on the poll pad. Let's search for Abraham Lincoln using his name, L-I-N for his last name and A-B-R for his first. We find him. At this stage, you could let the voter know once you confirm their voting address, their residential address with them, that you believe that their record is challenged. Then you can select their record. Now it's okay to take a moment and read the screen. You'll see here, just like with the CID screen previously with Millard Fillmore, this tells us that there is an unverifiable challenge against Abraham Lincoln. 
it means that the voter's name and or address was unable to be verified prior to election day. We're gonna ask the voter if they solemnly swear or affirm that they will fully and truly answer all the questions put to them concerning their eligibility at this election. Then we'll ask the voter what their full name is and what their residential address is. The voter's name and address match, the challenge should be cleared. If the information does not match, the voter will need to complete an election day registration form. You can scroll down on this screen to read all of the message. With each different kind of challenge, the messages in this section will change. We're gonna clear the challenge with Abraham Lincoln. We also could refuse the challenge if Abraham Lincoln refuses to answer the questions or fail him if he is not able to pass the challenge. If we do fail him, we need to confirm that that's what we want to do. In this case, we'll touch OK. The challenge was failed, and if the voter comes back in later in the day, it'll tell you what has happened. As it says on the screen, future election judges are going to want to review anything in the incident log. So if a voter does fail a challenge, be sure to record what happened in the incident log for future reference. If the voter passes the challenge, you would clear the challenge and process the voter, print their check-in certificate, and then hand, have them sign it and hand them their voter receipt. Then they would go to the ballot table and move through the rest of the voting process. Now that we've seen the process for several different types of voters, let's talk through what the pull pad will look like when a curbside voter is voting. As mentioned in a previous presentation, we talked through the curbside process in general. For this example, we'll pretend that Mike Miller is a curbside voter outside. Two election judges of opposite parties go out and process Mike Miller. They find that he does live in your precinct, so he completes the voter cert, excuse me, the curbside certification form and brings that form back inside. The election judges bring that form back inside and bring it to you as the pull pad judge. You'll then process Mike like he was standing in front of you. On the final screen, you'll check the curbside button, the curbside box. That will indicate that he was the curbside voter. As I said, we'll search for Mike Miller. We'll do MIL for Miller and MI for Mike. Here we find Mike Miller and confirmed his date of birth in 1933. Well, we also know that he lives on West Gulf Drive in unit number 201. We find this information on the curbside certification form. Once we've confirmed it, we will push accept. Then we'll double check that we've got all the information right and in touch the curbside button in the lower left hand on the left side of the screen. We'll initial and then hit submit. Again, don't forget to check that curbside box when processing a curbside voter. The curbside voters check-in certificate will print out. You'll note that at the bottom it says curbside on this certificate. The voter is not going to sign this check-in certificate because they've already signed the curbside certification form. You should staple this unsigned check-in certificate to the signed curbside certification form. Then fold up the curbside certification form and place the two at the bottom of your curbside, excuse me, at the bottom of your check-in bin. You'll count this as one of your check-ins at the end of the night. You will have a pull pad judge folder that includes paper forms and signs that will still be used. Some of the forms that we still will use are the notification of death form, the pull pad correction form, the remove from public list document, the voucher tally sheet, the head judge incident log will still be used to track voters that are turned away without registering. If a challenge 
A challenger wishes to form a challenge against a voter, they'll complete the blue challenge forms. As mentioned before, there's a precinct finder right on the pull pad. To find the precinct finder, you'll use the menu button in the upper left hand corner of the screen. Then you'll find the precinct finder button, which is a blue magnifying glass. You'll type in the house number. In this example, our voter lives at 500 Coconut Drive. So we'll type that in here. Next, you'll see when you click search that the voter lives in precinct 101. This will say an actual precinct name. It then will tell the precinct building that the voter can go to. And finally, give full driving directions. When you touch print location, a receipt like as over here will print out. You can send a voter with that receipt then if they need to go to a different location. However, if the precinct listed in this area is the precinct where you're working, then you know that the voter is in the right place. You can either then check them in or if they're not registered, go through the election day registration process with them. We'll now go through a few troubleshooting items and a couple things to remember. If the pull pad is having trouble charging, make sure that both of the ends, that the USB end is plugged into the power cube. Then be sure that the power cube is connected to the wall outlet and that the outlet is working. Make sure that the connection for the lightning connector is tight with the cord. You might need to wait about five minutes for the pull pad to charge if it has completely died. When there is sufficient power, it will automatically turn on. You'll call Washington County Elections if the pull pad screen becomes unresponsive. You'll also call us if you believe that you processed the wrong voter. Give us a call too if you need to reprint a check-in certificate for any reason. There are a number of administrative functions and ways to fix issues that happen throughout the day on the pull pad. However, because this is a new system to you and a new system for us, we want to help walk you through those troubleshooting items in these first elections. Again, our number is listed in multiple places throughout the precinct. If the printer stops working, First of all, make sure that the printer is turned on. Then confirm that the plugs are tight to the printer and also that the outlet and cords are securely connected. Next, check that the paper is installed correctly. You could do this by using the test print function or opening up the printer and looking at the paper. Then confirm connection with the pull pad. There's a green printer icon in the upper right hand corner. If your printer begins to blink red in the error button on the front, it means that your paper is getting low. You can process several voters while your paper is low. However, when you have a chance, ask your head judge where the additional rolls of paper are located. They'll either be in your clear tote or in your blue box. You'll open the printer using the button on the right hand top. Then you'll drop in the paper with the paper flap towards you and feeding it from the bottom or underneath the roll. Then you'll close the printer with a little bit of receipt paper hanging out and use the print test receipt button in the upper right hand corner of the pull pad to make sure that the paper is loaded correctly. These instructions can also be found in your pull pad folder. Additional things to remember. Please confirm that the battery charge on the pull pad is 90% or greater at the beginning of the day. And always run the pull pad connected to power. When entering or doing anything on the pull pad, always use the stylus. Please don't use your fingers. You can match, you should match the pull pad number. This is on a sticker on the back of the pull pad to the printer number that is assigned to it. 
the two communicate with each other and must be kept together at the same pull pad station throughout the day. The cases as well have a luggage tag with an orange piece of paper on them. Included on that orange tag is the pull pad number. All three of these should match when you pack up at the end of the night. We've talked about the rule of three throughout the day. Remember that when searching, less is more, and you'll search using the first three letters of a voter's last name and first name. If you can't find the voter, remember to search for them two additional ways beyond their name. You can use their date of birth, address, or license number. It's also okay to confirm with the voter how to spell their name. We've provided glass wipes to clean the iPad screen. However, there shouldn't be anyone touching the screen itself, so you shouldn't need to use these wipes very often. The glass wipes can be found inside the green case. In between election judges, you can sanitize the stylus. You can do so using a wipe or a damp paper towel with disinfectant sprayed on it. Please avoid the tip with um, sanitizer as alcohol tends to degrade that part portion of it. The voucher is the one that's going to use the second stylus. In between each voucher, you can sanitize that stylus. If you need to wipe down the rest of the pull pad, you can use a wipe or a damp paper towel to sanitize the printer, the stand, the ID tray, as well as the iPad case. You have made it through election day. At the end of the night, we hope that you'll count the check-in certificates in the short bin. These check-in and EDR certificates should stay with the same pull pad all day long. So again, you'll count the check-in certificates in the short bin, and that number should equal the check-in number on your pull pad screen. Then you count your EDR certificates in the long bin. They should equal the EDR number on your full pad screen. In this example on the screen, you should have 11 check-in certificates and one EDR certificate. Your head judge or their designee will come around to collect the check-in and EDR certificates. These certificates now will each go in their own white folder, excuse me, white envelope. Once you have balanced and counted your check-in and EDR certificates and the head judge or their designee has come around and collected those certificates, you can begin closing up the equipment. Check the area and make sure that you have all of your pieces. You will disassemble the iPad and then also disassemble the printer and its cords. The printer cords and the iPad arm are what go in the base of the green case first. To complete the rest of the pack up, you'll follow a picture found in the upper right hand corner of your green case. You'll return supplies to Washington County. All of the pull pads will come back to Washington County on election night. To ensure accuracy, remember that you need to match the Washington County number that is listed on the iPad, the printer, and the green case. As I mentioned, everything will go in in the proper order. Your printer cord, adapter, the printer cable, and the pull pad arm go in first. The ID tray goes in next in the front of the pull pad case on the left side. The lightning cord and this the lightning cord goes in next as well as the power block. The styluses go into the opening in the middle of the case. The printer goes in the big slot on the right. The pull pad base goes on top of your printer cords. And then the pull pad itself faces in so you can see the apple. It gets strapped in then. Then you can secure the latches on the case. The last thing to pack up at the end of the night is your MiFi unit. You'll pack it up in the box and return it where you found it in the morning. This will either be in your clear tote or blue box. 
Thanks for watching this poll pad training. We're sure that you have more questions. On election morning, you could pair up with another election judge and together process a few voters. Then you can spread out and go to your own poll pad. Feel free to also call Washington County Elections throughout the day on election day if you have any questions.